Hey, welcome to another Bio 100. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about evolution and what is it. And this is the topic that's near and dear to my heart. This is something I get to do a lot of research with, um, and I'm really excited to dive into it. So I realize that there are probably some of you in the course who are a little bit apprehensive about the th about the theory of evolution or the topic of evolution in general, um, and I just want to just have you just you know rest at ease. Don't worry about it too much. The whole point of covering this lecture is that you understand what evolution is, that you can answer the questions properly. You don't necessarily have to quote unquote believe it. That said, um, I will say that evolution isn't necessarily something you believe because it's science, right? So it's something that you look at all the data, you look at all the evidence, and then you either accept or reject it. Um, but just the same, I, I do want to make it easy on students who who feel like they have issues with this and that they can't accept it. I also don't want you to have any issues when you go to take the exam. Uh, one of the things you can say on those exams, if you're really uptight about it and concerned, is that uh, you know if there's an answer to a question about human evolution or something you feel uncomfortable with, you can say Dr. Bybee said, and that way you don't have to um, say that you feel these things are true or whatever they may be. Although again, remember this is science, so we're just looking at the data and we're accepting and rejecting. Okay, so I'll just continue on here. So what is evolution? Well. Biological evolution is really a, ch a change in the genetic characteristics of a population of organisms over time. So what are evolutionary changes? So how are they inherited? They're inherited by genes, we've talked about these, and environmental pressures. So these environmental pressures can cause changes um, that are not necessarily evolutionary, but once they're inherited and moved throughout the population as a result of environmental pressures, um, it can cause evolution. So here's an example here, right? So this is a mite. This is a mite in a greenhouse right here. And you can see some, there's some egg jobbies hanging out here, right? Another smaller mite living in a greenhouse. Well, we're gonna use these to demonstrate what evolution is, and we're gonna use it in the context of pesticide resistance. So. You have, what, I, what I want you to do is hit the pause button and I want you to work through this on your own and see if you can work out the evolutionary process in this schematic. So hit the pause button, go through it. Okay, hopefully you took the time to do that. I'm actually not gonna go on over it because I think it's pretty self-explanatory and I'm gonna trust um, that you actually took the time to go over it. So, Looking at this figure, I want you to, to hit the pause button again and ask yourself these questions. Where does res resistance come from? When did resistance arrive? And what environmental factor made resistance arise or become beneficial? So hit the pause button and work through that. Okay. So where did resistance come from? Did you figure that out? Do you think resistance came from the pesticide being sprayed or was the resistance already in the population? Well, that's pretty key and that's important. I want you to think about that because it also has to do with when did the resistance arrive, right? So where did it come from? Probably came from something like the genetics within the population when did the resistance arrive? Was it present before the application of the pesticide? And what environmental factors made resistance arise, arise or become beneficial? You should be able to answer these questions on your own. If you can't, I would have you reach out to the TAs. Okay, so another thing to keep in mind is that populations evolve, not individuals. I can't stress this enough, not individuals. A lot of students think that individuals evolve. And maybe this is just because we put this human view on it and we talk about evolving as individuals, right? That we can have changes in how we think over time. Well, that's not exactly the same as biological evolution. So here's a, here's, we use the mite example, right? So you have this genetic structure of the population that gets changed. Individuals without a gene for resistance die. Over time, the population changes to mostly resistant individuals. Well, we see these exact same things in lice. So this is a head louse, this is a pubic louse or a crab. Um, and we can see how these have actually evolved resistance over time to uh, application of essentially pesticides. And then these are bed bugs as well. Bed bugs, any of you who are from um, the Midwest know that bed bugs are on a massive 
tear right now that they're really hard to control and that is because they've evolved past most of the original applications that we had to kill bed bugs okay so what's the process that evolution occurs natural selection is how it occurs and this is really the process by which traits usually genetic traits that we're talking about become more or less common in a population due to consistent effects on survival and reproduction of their forebears. So here's an example of this. Here's how natural selection might play out. So you have this, pop, here's the original population, okay? And organisms with favorable traits are gonna survive better, or they're gonna have better survival chances. And if you, oh, generally, if you survive better, you're gonna pass on more genes, okay? So here's the original population. Let's say there are some mutations that create three variations here. This mutation may go extinct in the next generation. Wasn't very favorable. As a matter of fact, it was unfavorable. So it gets selected against and it's wiped out of the population. But you still have these two mutations. So reproduction occurs, mutation um, occurs. I don't know if you notice it, but there's a very subtle grayscale change here in both of these that now you have four mutations in the population, okay? But these two right here are not advantageous, so they get wiped out. Um, these two keep going, right? These favorable mutations are more likely to survive, so they're going to keep on in the population. Now, what's actually interesting here is if you go back to the original population, is this original gene type around? And the answer is no. It's actually wiped out through evolution. Okay, so generally the longer an organism lives, the more reproductive opportunities it will have, more offspring may be produced, more organisms with the same favorable trait than before. That's what we're seeing here, right? Um, and then you have these examples we've talked about already, pesticide resistance and the mite, um, or, or you know insects that can eat crops that become pesticide resistant. And we also talked about it in lice and bed bugs. And there's antibiotic resistance as well to certain bacteria because we've used so many antibiotics so consistently in the medical system that it actually turns out that some bacteria and certain strains of bacteria are now resistant to any sort of antibiotic that could be used to them. Okay, so we within evolution, there's been this argument where you could break it down into two types, the macroevolution and microevolution. So microevolution is really just change within population of a species. So this is actually observable. You can see this. It's not very controversial. You see this. Mosquitoes evolving resistance to DDT, which was an insecticide your parents will probably know something about. Um, HIV strains are evolving resistance to antiviral drugs. I showed you an example of that at the beginning of the semester. You can see that um, within individuals uh, today that are being treated for HIV. And macroevolution, these are really results of many microevolutionary changes over a long period of time. So these are essentially resulting in new species. This is a little bit more controversial among non-biologists because you can't really observe it. It takes millions and billions of years for this to happen. Um, but these are evolutionary course of, um, that really have resulted in things like horses and whales and dragonflies and humans. And we'll talk about some of these things as we go through. Before we do that, I want you to try and do an activity where you can apply just your current knowledge of how evolution works. What I want you to do is I want you to give you a scenario. You have a starting population of 12 mating pairs and they have the following alleles. Okay, So these are genes that, that make them jump high, six fingers or claws on the right hand, and they're omnivore. Okay, remember what omnivores are? All right, so I want you to take these individuals, like this population, and I want you to see, to think about in your mind what would happen with this, if this population lived in the desert, lived in the rainforest, lived in the cave, or lived in the Arctic, okay? <clears throat> and I want you to think about them living in each one of these habitats after a thousand generations. And I want you to define five things about each one of these environments um, that are that are interesting, right? So deserts generally really dry, rainforests are very wet. This is forested. This is generally not. Cave systems, right? They can have water in them. They don't have water in them, but they definitely have very little light, if any. The Arctic is extremely cold, right? So just think about it. I want you to write down five things for each environment that's fairly unique. What food is exploited in the environment? 
How have they adapted to their environment? And what types of physical changes has your population undergone? And then I want you to draw it. So you're going to have your original population here. You're going to imagine what it, what it looks like after a thousand generations in each one of these habitats. And I want you to draw your organism out. Now, this might seem a little silly. Seriously, hit the pause button. Take the time. This is really going to be helpful to you. Okay, hopefully you did this activity. If you didn't, hit the pause button, do it. Um, I'm gonna keep moving on. So one of the things I want you to do though is just compare, right? Like what did you see? What are the differences in your population of whatever animal group you wanted to pick with these alleles after a thousand generations? Compare and contrast and figure out, you know, why? Why does one go a different, one evolve a different way than another? All right, um, this is kind of what I went on at the, be this is kind of what I was talking about at the very beginning of the lecture. The evolution is not a belief system. It's not something you really believe. It's a, thi it's a scientific theory. It's really just based on evidence. There's, there's really not belief here. Um, and, and I think that, that this kind of goes, this kind of plays into this bigger ambiguity is that when you're talking to your friends and you're like, I have a theory, right? What you're really talking about is a best guess some sort of tentative explanation. It's essentially a hypothesis. But in scientific language, when I'm speaking with another scientist and I say, and I say there's, there's a theory, what I'm really saying is there's this body of accepted evidence that's supported by many, many different types of tests and examples. As a matter of fact, a scientific theory between scientists is essentially a fact. Um, that it is a hypothesis that has been tested in so many ways in so many different with so many different data that we just accept it as a fact uh, and there are some examples right the atomic there's atomic theory gra the theory of gravity germ theory and these are all equivalent and equal to the theory of evolution in a scientific setting uh, here's some of the early views of evolution um, the theory of evolution is sometimes called Darwinian Darwinianism um, because Darwin is the one credited with coming up with the idea uh, and introducing evolution into the mainstream. But Charles Darwin did not invent the idea. There were many, many scientists before them, including Charles Darwin's own grandfather, who had ideas about evolution, but just didn't package it all together and put it forward uh, into a mainstream idea for science to then test and turn it into a theory. So that's why Darwin gets credited with it, but there were many, many others before him and at his same time that helped him develop the idea. So Darwin is pretty fascinating. So at the age of 22, he jumps on the HMS Beagle, uh, this ship, and spends a five-year trip, uh, five years going around the globe collecting specimens uh, as the naturalist on the HMS Beagle. It sounds pretty fantastic, actually. I would have loved to have had this opportunity myself. Um, and so what is the theory of evolution exactly? Well, we've talked about some of it, um, but there are also um, this idea that all present species descended from a single common ancestor. And so some people are like, well, wait, what's a single common ancestor? Well, when you're looking at a phylogeny, which is basically just a genealogy, right? You have these points, these splits. These are called the common ancestors. So this would be the common ancestor of all of these species, this would be the common ancestor of these three, and this is the common ancestor of just A and B. Um, to look at it more in a schematic, this is a very stylized, artistic phylogeny, but the common ancestor for all of life would be down here at that split. All species um, present on Earth today are also the product of billions of years of accumulated evolutionary change. And that is also a major tenet of the evolutionary, th of the theory of evolution. Um, and the phylogenies that we talked about previously were, you know, were, were pretty stylized or simplistic, um, but in reality, they probably look something like this, where you have uh, plants here, fungi, protostomes, echinoderms, here's sharks hanging out in here, fish, okay? We have these massive phylogenies that try to account for everything that we see in our world today the millions of species that we have and just so you know humans we're sitting way out here towards the tip of that tree 
So in order to understand a little bit about what we're talking about, we need to understand phylogenetic trees, or really simply they're kind of genealogies that we use to, um, to help us understand evolutionary scenarios, okay? And when we put a phylogeny into a science, when we put a genealogy into a scientific context, we call it, we call it a phylogeny. So here's a phylogeny here. Let me orient you a little bit. So we have the earless seals and the walrus, okay? They're found here at node D. Now D represents the common ancestor between these two, and these branches can actually rotate. So you could put earless seals over here and walrus over here, and it would be the exact same phylogeny. Nothing has changed any relationships there. As a matter of fact, you could even put eared seals, you could put that branch out here, and you could put the earless seals and the walrus seals on a branch inside, and it would also be the same. If that didn't make sense, that's okay. Um, we'll get into this a little bit more and hopefully make some sense of it. Okay, so looking at this phylogeny, oh, I should say this is the more ancestral or primitive part of the phylogeny, and this is the more derived. Um, you should be able to answer these four questions, okay? And this, these are kind of one in one. These kind of have are one and the same. So what living animal is most closely related to earless seals? So here's your earless seal. What living animal is most closely related to that individual? So you should be able to look at this phylogeny and go, okay, so if I come down here, these two individuals share a common ancestor, so walruses are going to be the most closely related to the earless seals. Good. What is our most closely related to the eared seals? So that's what's right here. Bears or walruses? Bears or walruses, so you have to choose. Um, sorry, or bears or, or walruses and earless seals. So again, you should be able to do it just like question one. That's why they're both question one here. You can go down and you can say, okay, where's the common ancestor? So the common ancestor here is C. Here's the eared seals. So that means these form a monophyletic group. So earless seals and walruses are going to be more closely related to eared seals than bears. Okay. All right. What is the most primitive living animal on this phylogeny? So you should be able to get this pretty quickly. You go down here, most ancestral branch are gonna be the mustelids. These are things like skunks and badgers and wolverines. Uh, and then what is the most recent common ancestor of earless seals and the walrus? What is it? You should be able to get that one on your own. I'm not gonna answer it. And then what does A represent on this phylogeny? A right here, what does that represent? That is actually the most recent common ancestor of all the species that we're looking at. Okay, so what is the evidence for evolution and common descent? So there are several lines of biological evidence that point to com our common ancestor. One is that anatomical similarity between organisms, vestigial or what we call quote unquote useless traits in modern species, shared developmental pathways is another, and DNA similarities, distribution of organisms on Earth, Fossil evidence, and we're going to hit each one of these uh, individually. Sorry, I hit the button too fast there. Fossil evidence here at, the, here at the bottom. We're going to hit each one of these topics individually, and show you uh, what we what is as scientists is accepted as the biological evidence for a common ancestor and thus evolution. So anatomical similarities. Okay, so the anatomy should be similar if the organisms if there is evolution, and closely re related organisms should have similar anatomy. Well, the vertebrate limb has the same bones in it, meaning the underlying structure is similar despite the very different functions. So if you look at a bird bone here, right? Here's the humerus, here is the radius, okay? Here's the, sorry, here's the ulna, here's the radius, here are the metacarpals here, and here are the phalanges, okay? If we look at a bat, you can see them as well. Here's the humerus, ulna, radius, metacarpals, phalanges. And you can do this in whales, you can do this in cats, horses, and what's absolutely fascinating is that those same bones are present in the human limb as well. Okay, and then you can use these anatomical sim similarities to show relatedness between organisms, okay? So here's a, here's a phylogeny again, all right? What trait do a bear, seal, and sea lion have in common? Okay, so let's go bear, seal, sea lion, so let's go down. What do they all have in common? It's actually right here. 
they all have a short tail. All of those have that in common. What traits do a seal and a sea lion have in common? I'm going to let you just hit the pause button and answer questions two and three on your own, and then we'll come back together after that. Okay, were you able to get two? What traits do a seal and a sea lion have in common? Do you see it? The hint is you go up, you look at seal and sea lion, you look at where they come together, what does the common ancestor show? Abdominal testes. Name a trait that is unique to only one group. Can you see them? There's, like, there's two options on there. These are, treat, these are traits that are unique to only one group. So if you look at cats, they have retractable claws. If you look at seal, they have a loss of ear flaps. All right. Now, there are useless traits in modern species as well. Okay, these are what we call vestigial traits. They're diminished in size or usefulness during the course of evolution. So it doesn't mean that, they, that there is absolutely no use for them, but it means that they either do not have a use anymore and they are useless, or they have a very diminished use compared to what they used to have. So they're kind of represented that it's this, it's, it, it was once functional and necessary for survival, but over time that function became either diminished or non-existent. So here's some examples. Wings and flightless birds. So this is a dinosaur bird uh, from Australia, and you can see it has, it has wings, but they no longer fly. The wings have a different function now, um, which is essentially keeping, uh, they have these long uh, feathered uh, center parts of the feather now that essentially push um, vegetation away from the edge of them. Um, the sexual organs of dandelions. So dandelions actually do not reproduce sexually, but they still have the sexual portions of the flower. Uh, and then the hind leg bones in whales. So whales have these hind leg bones. Uh, sometimes the pelvis and even the humerus, bits of the humerus can be left behind, but whales are clearly not using those anymore. Um, and then uh, species with eyes that cannot see. So this is a species of cavefish. It still has an eye there with eye tissue, but there's no genetics underneath to help it see uh, any, to help it uh, capture any light with the eye. So there are some examples in humans. Um, we have wisdom teeth, uh, which actually a huge part of the human population, not a huge part, but a significant portion of the human population actually lacks wisdom teeth. I'm missing two of them. I only had two wisdom teeth, lucky for me. Um, there's the human appendix here where you can see that in other organisms, the appendix is larger than what you see in humans. Um, these are the erector, erector pili, and these are little tiny muscle attachments that attach to the base of each one of your hairs. And when you're cold or frightened or whatever, your hair stands on end, and that is actually done in a way to, uh, if, you're sh if you're frightened, they stand on end so that you look larger, you're more threatening. Um, if you're cold, they stand on end because in our ancestors we had hair and that increases the air volume that can be heated by your body around you. It's for warmth. Um, there's also the palmer grasp reflex. This is a reflex of, uh, of babies where they can actually hold almost their entire body weight, um, often sometimes their own body weight. When they're newborns, if you put your hand in their, uh, if you put your thumbs in their tiny little hands and lift, they'll be able to just hold on and grasp. Uh, there's also what we call the, pleaky, uh, the pleca similarinus. This is the uh, internal portion of the eye that birds and other organisms have. It's like, a, it's like another eyelid that goes this way across the eye. You can see it fully covering the eye here in the bird. Uh, humans, we have it as well. It's just very, very reduced sitting in here. It's kind of that red part of your eye if you want to take a look at it next time you're in front of the mirror. There's also the tailbone as well. So the tailbone is much reduced from what it was originally, um, and it is essentially there for some sm small amounts of muscle attachment now compared to what it used to be, which was supporting a tail. There's also shared developmental pathways, so similarity among embryos kind of helps us understand our evolutionary pa past. So here's snakes, chickens, possums, cats, bats, and humans, and what's interesting is that each one of us humans uh, and also all these other mammals 
had gill slits at one point in time and a tail. And this tail uh, throughout development becomes reduced and um, fused, and whereas in other animals it does not. Uh, and what you'll notice as you that these other organisms have tails as well. Um, but there's just a lot of similarity between these organisms that give us hints as to where our evolutionary path came from. Um, here's another one. Closely related species on a tree have similar DNA. Distantly related species have less similar DNA. So here are closely related species on this phylogeny. Their DNA matches about 90%. And then uh, this individual's DNA is 82% similar with these individuals and 72% similar for this Caspian tern with these individuals. And this is pretty intense, right? That we can actually have DNA sequence that is very, very similar. Um, so if you're looking at humans and this monkey at a certain genetic locus, which is uh, cytochrome C gene, which is just one gene, there's actually only one um, difference between the two genes, between monkeys and humans. Um, there's 13 differences between dogs, monkeys, and humans, 20 between rattlesnakes, dogs. You kind of get the picture, right? But out here, clear to moths. So this, is, this gene is 1,500 base pairs long, and there's only 36 differences between the moth and uh, humans and rhesus monkeys, which is pretty interesting to think about. Okay, so which hypothesis is most likely based on DNA evidence? Now, I know you've never built a phylogeny before. That's okay. I want you to just hit the pause button and figure out, based on this information before down here, which of these two hypotheses is most likely. Okay, let's come back together here. Hopefully you took a second and tried to actually figure that out on your own. One of the things you'll see is that if we look at that where the T's map on these phylogeny, you have T here and a T here. It's not variable across any of these species, so it doesn't really mean too much. But then you have in position one, you have A. So you have an A right there that, that would link both whale and hippo, so they have the similarity of an A. The pig has none not a similarity or is a T, I guess. And then you have these, this G as well, right? So you have this G that would also tell you that the whale and hippo are more closely related than they are to the pig, to each other than they are to the pig. And then position four would actually give you something different, hippo and pig being related, but that's not even an option for us up here. So you know right away that this is the most likely hypothesis and because, and we know that DNAs are more similar in more closely related animals. All right, distribution of organisms on Earth is another one. So different species are going to resemble other species found on the mainland. So here's an example of this. You have these three bird species here. Um, this one's going to be uh, on these islands that are very close to Ecuador. They all resemble each other because they're very close um, to um, geographically to each other in Ecuador. And here's another example whereas you have these species in this bird, these uh, osprey birds in Vanuatu and Fiji that are that are much more closely related to each other here. This phylogeny shows that they're closely related to each other than they are to the ones in Northern Australia over here. And that makes sense because they're closely, um, th these birds are more close to each other geographically than they are to this one. All right, and there's also a ton of fossil evidence that we could go into, but in horses, for example, you have this really solid sequence of evolutionary change within the lineage. If you go back into the fossil record, going from the recent all the way to the Eocene, you see that there are changes in dentition and the forelegs that match kind of the ancestor. And if we look at the forelegs, the ancestor of horses actually had these four toes. And then over evolutionary time, following the fossil record, you can actually see very clearly where toe five here becomes diminished in this species, still diminished here at this time, but then you'll see the, that bone f that uh, that this toe four is also starting to reduce, and then in the current ancestors you can see that toe five is almost non-existent, toe four is just down to the small fragmentary bone as is toe two, and the horses actually walk around on their third finger, uh, essentially is what it is. And this is fascinating because you see these same transi transi transitional changes in whales, 
dragonflies, water fleas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are really solid fossil records that show these transitions through time. Okay, so this is where we're going to end. What I want you to do, I'm going to play a clip here. I want you to watch this clip, and I want you to tell me what is wrong with this clip. And I want you to think about the, the lines of evidence that we just went through that support evolution, and I want you to use those as your argument for identifying what is wrong in this clip. Writing's not that easy. Oh, I apologize for the ad. This sentence is grammatically correct. <laughs> So I hope you can kind of take a look at that and identify where some wrong portions of this video, of this clip are, and use the lines of evidence to refute them. And uh, that's where we'll stop today. I hope that was informative and that you found some information in there compelling. I think next time we're going to talk about human evolution, which is really exciting and a, a really fun thing to do. So I'll go ahead and stop this right now. And that is where we'll end today.